Hello and welcome to this edition of World at War. My name is Mohammed Saleh. The Wagner chief Yevgeny Prigozhin has done the unthinkable. In an act of open mutiny, the Wagner chief Yevgeny Prigozhin has warned that his mercenaries are now heading to Moscow in a bid to take over the Russian capital. And not just this, Prigozhin claims that his Wagner mercenaries have already taken control of the southern city of rostov on don and that his intention is to oust the Russian military leadership. Anti-terror measures along with military vehicles have been rolled out in Moscow. The situation in Russia is so serious at this moment that the Russian President Vladimir Putin had to come out and issue a televised statement. Without mincing words, Putin said that the Wagner mutiny is treason and that punishment will be harsh. But the question is this, why has the Wagner chief who was instrumental in winning the Battle of Bakhmut now come out in open defiance against the Russian army? And why is the Wagner chief now calling the Russian invasion of Ukraine an operation based on lies? Almost no one expected the Russian invasion of Ukraine to take the sudden and drastic turn. The Wagner chief, who for months had howled and railed against the professional Russian army and its leadership, has staged an open mutiny. Especially at a time when Ukraine is thrusting forth with its counter-offensive. But this is precisely what has happened. Gun-toting Wagner mercenaries have now announced that they've taken control of the Russian city of rostov on don At this moment, the Wagner chief is said to have about 25,000 mercenaries under his command. And in an ominous audio message posted by him on his Telegram channel, Prigozhin has claimed that his mercenaries have now crossed back into Russia and that they will go all the way. We only fight the professionals. But if somebody stands in our way, we will destroy everything that stands in our way. We are giving a hand to anybody. Don't spit in it. We are going further. We are going all the way. But what does Prigozhin mean when he says that his mercenaries will go all the way? Is he fighting against the Russian army or is his grouse just against the Russian military leadership? This is not a military coup. It is a march for justice. Our actions do not in any way interfere with troops. So if this is not a military coup, then why have the Wagner mercenaries taken over Rostov on Don? And why is the Wagner chief threatening to go all the way? But the Kremlin is not taking any chances. The security cordon around the Kremlin has been tightened. I repeat, any internal turmoil is a mortal threat to our statehood, to us as a nation. This is a blow to Russia, to our people. The actions we will take to protect our homeland from such a threat will be harsh. All those who consciously chose the path of betrayal, who prepared an armed mutiny, who chose the path of blackmail and terrorism, will suffer an inevitable punishment, will answer both before the law and our people. The Wagner headquarters in St. Petersburg has been rounded up. There is palpable fear on the streets of Moscow. You can see military hardware heading out onto the streets. They scrambled everyone. But our guys are working normally. I think they're primarily protecting our people. But it's frightening. Of course, you sit at home thinking about what might happen. It's disturbing both for you and your loved ones. All through the Battle of Bakhmut, Yevgeny Prigozhin had lambasted the Russian Defense Minister Sergei Shogu. He had accused the Russian Commander-in-Chief, Valery Gerasimov, of incompetence. He had also accused the professional Russian military of not giving adequate supplies and ammunition to his valiant mercenaries who had fought off the Ukrainian challenge at Bakhmut. But now, Yevgeny Prigozhin has done the one thing that no soldier can ever do, of staging a mutiny in the middle of a raging war with the threat that his mercenaries and I'm marching to take over the Russian capital. Armed Israeli settlers went on a rampage through several Palestinian towns on the night of the 20th of June. An estimated 400 to 500 Israeli settlers set fire to several Palestinian homes, torched cars and also burnt agricultural fields. At least one Palestinian was killed 
while several others were injured. But what has caused this mindless violence? Now, according to certain reports, the incidents of violence, arson and vandalism by the Israeli settlers were provoked by the killing of four Israelis on the outskirts of a settlement near Ramallah. But the question that needs to be asked is this. When the Israeli forces were around, how did a mob of this scale of Israeli settlers go on a spate of arson and vandalism, pretty much unchecked in their violent activities? The violence began on the night of the 20th of June. A swarm of armed Israeli settlers poured into the occupied Palestinian town of Turmus Ayah and set fire to dozens of homes and cars. Fields of wheat and other farmland were also set on fire. Videos that are doing the rounds on social media show as to how the mob of the Israeli settlers went almost unchallenged as it went over the hill, specifically targeting the Palestinian homes. Other villages such as Huara, Aluban Asharkia, and Aluban Al Gharbi also came under attack. As this CCTV footage, filed by the Reuters news agency, will show you, the intent of these acts of vandalism was to destroy property and to inflict maximum financial damage. One is still emotional about what happened. We were surprised to see a large number of settlers that had the protection of the Israeli army and police. They tried to raid Al Luban village but were not able to because youth confronted them. They tried to arson houses but youth confronted them again. When the settlers were unable to raid the village, we sought protection. On the 19th of June, Israeli forces backed by the Apache helicopter gunships killed six Palestinians, including a 15-year-old teenager, and it wounded 90 others during an hours-long raid into the occupied Palestinian West Bank. Footage released by the Israeli Defense Ministry will give you a glimpse of the scale of the operation that was carried out by the Israeli forces in one of the most densely populated neighborhoods. According to the Israeli media, the use of Apache helicopter gunships was a 20-year first in the West Bank. Eight Israeli soldiers were wounded during the intense raid on the Palestinian city of Jenin. A Palestinian journalist, Ashraf Shavish, was shot in the waist while he was on a rooftop covering the Israeli raid. The very next day, a Palestinian gunman opened fire on an Israeli settlement, killing four Israeli settlers. Responding to the attack on the Israeli settlers, Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu was already under pressure on his home turf over his controversial legal overhaul has threatened to settle scores. Our forces are now operating on the ground to settle the score with the murderers. We have already proven in the last months that we will settle the score with all the murderers without exception. Everyone who hurt us is either in the grave or in prison, so it will be here as well. But I want to say to all those who seek our souls, all options are open. We will continue to fight terrorism with all our might and we will defeat it. Peace talks last broke down between Israel and Palestine in 2014. And since then, Israel has carried out expansion of illegal settlements in Palestinian lands. And this is a concern that has been raised by the United Nations as well. We reiterate that the establishment by Israel of settlements in the Palestinian territory occupied since 1967, including East Jerusalem, has no legal validity and constitutes a flagrant violation under international law. Mr. Venisland urged the government of Israel to halt and reverse such decisions, which are a major obstacle to the achievement of the two-state solution and a just, lasting and comprehensive peace. So as things stand, with no prospect of talks, and Israel continuing with its illegal settlements, peace appears to have little to no chance. At least 41 people, mostly students, were massacred in western Uganda on the 16th of June. Eight others remain in a critical condition, while six others were abducted by the Islamic State-linked rebel militants. This is the worst such attack in Uganda in over a decade. The Ugandan military is in pursuit of the militants behind the grisly cross-border raid. But why have the rebels targeted a school 
after nearly about 25 years in Uganda? Is it primarily for the shock value to emphasize that they are very much active and capable of launching such attacks? The normally peaceful East African country of Uganda was caught napping by a cross-border raid late on Friday evening. At least 37 students aged between 13 and 18 were hacked and burned to death. The brutal attack targeted the Luguriha Secondary School in Mpondwe in the frontier district of Kasese, barely two kilometers from the border with the Democratic Republic of Congo. Reportedly, at least five militants linked to Allied Democratic Forces, or ADF, set dormitories alight and hacked students to death. Six students were also abducted to be used as porters for the food looted from the privately owned school store. We hadn't yet fallen asleep when we heard people arriving and saying, open up, open up. We didn't reply. One of us took the trouble to go and look through the window. He saw people wearing military fatigues and holding weapons and machetes. He came back to tell us that the people were armed. While he was explaining, these people kept knocking on the door, ordering, open up, open up. What's baffling is that the Ugandan military had intel two days prior to the attack regarding ADF's presence in the area, and yet they failed to avert the attack. The attackers, on the other hand, had detailed information about the school and knew where the boys' and girls' dormitories were. The boys' dormitory had been locked. The boys locked the dormitory, uh, their dormitory, and they were in the dormitory. So they, these terrorist group couldn't enter, so they threw in a, a bomb. They threw in a, a petrol bomb. So these children were burnt completely. The girls, on the other hand, opened the door and tried to run out. And these this, this evil group got them and killed them with pangas. A manhunt was launched to rescue the kidnapped and nab the rebels who fled toward Virunga, a vast expanse on the border with Uganda and Rwanda, and a globally renowned sanctuary for rare species, including mountain gorillas. Five days later, Ugandan military claimed to have rescued three out of six kidnapped students. Dozens of militias active in the mineral-rich Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo used the park as a hideout. With links to the Islamic State, the extremist group ADF is one of the deadliest groups. Primarily active in the strife-torn Congo's east, like the M23 rebels. The militant group, mainly composed of Muslim Ugandan rebels, was founded in Western Uganda in the 1990s. In retaliation to the long-serving president Yoweri Museveni's government, alleged persecution of Muslims. The group has launched attacks for years from bases in volatile Democratic Republic of Congo's east. But attacks on the Ugandan side of the border are rare. Apart from highlighting that they are still a force to be reckoned with, the brutal school attack by the ADF has punched a few holes in the security claims of the longtime leader. At least 46 people were killed at a women's prison in Honduras on the 20th of June. Violent clashes erupted when prisoners belonging to the feared Barrio 18 gang reportedly burst into a cell block and opened fire indiscriminately at rival inmates with high caliber weapons. They proceeded to settle out the place, resulting in part of the prison being completely destroyed. Identifying victims has now become very complex as many bodies are charred beyond recognition. Gangs wield considerable clout inside the Honduran prisons 
often setting their own rules and even selling prohibited goods. Our next poll gets you all the details. The Central American nation of Honduras was shocked by a grisly prison riot early Tuesday morning. The carnage, worst at a women's prison in recent memory, took place about 25 kilometers north of the capital, Tegucigalpa. About 900 prisoners were at the CIFAS correctional facility in Tamara when the riot broke out. Reportedly, Barrio 18 gang members had smuggled in guns and other weapons, a recurring problem in Honduran prisons. In the ensuing violent clashes between rival Barrio 18 and Mara Salvatrucha, or MS-13 gang members, at least 41 were killed. An astonishing half of them charred to death. So far, we can say that 46 bodies from the Tamara feminine prison riot entered these forensic medicine offices. 23 of these 46 bodies were charred. The rest of the deaths were apparently caused by firearms or knives. They are identifying the bodies and making the respective autopsies on the 23 that were not charred because it is easier to identify them. Close to 13, 15 bodies have been handed over to their relatives. Described by the Honduran president Xiomara Castro as monstrous, these murderers have again put the spotlight on a nation racked by corruption and criminal gangs. Immediate measures included announcement of a state of emergency and the dismissal of security minister Ramon Sabillon. Angry, anxious and inconsolable relatives and friends of the deceased inmates struggled to deal with the tragedy to have befallen them. As a grandmother, I need to know if my granddaughter is alive or already dead. Because I don't know anything. That's all we want. We want justice and we want them to give us the names of each of our relatives. If that makes them angry, let them be angry. But we want to know about our relatives. Honduran prisons often turn into battlegrounds between criminal gangs vying for control. Honduras forms Central America's triangle of death along with neighbors El Salvador and Guatemala. The region is plagued by murderous gangs called Maras that control drug trafficking and organized crime and are primarily responsible for the soaring homicide rate in Honduras. At 40 murders per 100,000 inhabitants last year, Honduras' homicide rate was four times higher than the world average. All this has resulted in the migration of young people, mainly to the United States, seeking safety and a better future. Will Tuesday's prison riot step up pressure on the leftist Castro to emulate the drastic zero-tolerance, no-privilege prisons set up in neighboring El Salvador? The northern Argentine province of Jujuy has been rocked by violent protests. First, on the 17th of June, indigenous scholar people clashed with the riot police while protesting a reform to the provincial constitution that had been approved a day earlier. The controversial constitutional reform limits the right to block roads and streets during protests, as well as the occupation of public buildings. Now, just a couple of days later, on the 20th of June, hundreds of protesters again clashed with the riot police, while the legislators were swearing in the new constitution. In an effort to repress the demonstration, the police resorted to firing tear gas and rubber bullets. So the question is this, why is Hui, which borders Bolivia, witnessing these violent protests in different parts of the province? Our next report gets you the details. The right to protest is intrinsic in a functioning democracy. But what happens when this very right comes into threat? A climate of extreme tension engulfed the Argentine province of Jujuy after Jujuy's governor, Gerardo Morales of the opposition radical party, 
approved a constitutional reform on the 16th of June. The controversial reform states the express prohibition of total blockade of streets and roadblocks, as well as any other disturbance to the right of free movement of the inhabitants of the province. Immediately after the approval, roadblocks were set up across the province. The most significant one being at the crossroads of two national highways that lead to Chile and Bolivia. Indigenous scholar people responsible for these blockades clashed with the riot police. Several indigenous communities in Huwi province oppose the lithium operations in their territories and claim that the reform is actually a tool in the hands of the governor to develop the mines. The reform has triggered multiple mobilizations. On Tuesday, hundreds of mostly left-wing protesters broke windows of the offices of the Legislative Power Headquarters in the city of San Salvador de Jujuy. Riot police were called to rein in the protesters who were throwing objects and setting vehicles on fire and were violently entering into the legislature building. Tear gas and rubber bullets were used by the police to disperse the protesters. The governor, members of the judiciary and the conventional constituents barely managed to leave the legislature before the protesters took over one of its adjacent buildings. Morales has blamed the government of President Alberto Fernandez, the unions and other organizations for inciting these protests. Radical Civil Union, the party that Morales belongs to, is one of the parties in the main opposition coalition at the national level. These protests by the indigenous people, coupled with the teachers' strike that's been ongoing for several days, has got Argentina staring at increased transport disruptions and days of unrest. And with that, it's a wrap on this edition of World at Warm. And if you want to reach out to me with any comments, suggestions or feedback, please feel free to do so on the Twitter handle that you're seeing on your screens. I'm your host, Mohamed Saleh, and I'll see you again next week.